issues with Pacific Northwest LNG in BC. My name is Shannon McPhail and I'm the Executive Director of the Skeena Watershed Conservation Coalition here in Hazleton. Uh, we're just seeing a few more people sign in. We've had uh, a little over a hundred sign up which is great. Um, and so I'm going to introduce our speakers tonight. We we wanted to uh, have a way that people could get education and learn about this project uh, in its full scale. So from northeastern BC where the fracking would be needed uh, all the way through the pipelines and all the way to the um, to Patronus's terminal in the Skeena estuary. So tonight we have Kira Sharp. Uh, Kira is finishing her Master of Science at Simon Fraser University and has done a lot of the on-the-ground science out in the estuary itself and she'll be talking about salmon tonight followed by Max Neweiser with the Pembina Institute who is a climate policy analyst with Pembina. Uh, Caleb Bain who has a law degree from the University of Victoria and is currently the executive director of the Keepers of the Water. David Hughes who worked with the Geological Survey of Canada for 30 plus years and is now an earth scientist and president of global sustainability research. Uh, Karen Tamu of the Pemina Institute will be moderating your questions and I will be moderating the presentation and speakers. So each speaker is going to go for about 10 minutes and afterwards we will have about 15 minutes for questions and answers. And so we'd like to start with Kira Sharp from Simon Fraser University. Hello, uh, good evening everyone. I'd like to say a big thank you to SWCC for organizing this webinar and having me here to speak about this important issue. So today I'll be first discussing what the science says about the significance of the Flora Bank location for the project. And then I'll be discussing the potential risks that this uh, PNW and LNG terminal poses to salmon. So the science that I'll be sharing with, with you today comes from a greater research team of which I'm fortunate to be a small part of. So we are a team of researchers that have been studying how, where, and why juvenile salmon use the estuary. Uh, we're based out of Prince Rupert and our team is made up of researchers from the Lakhalam First Nation, Skeena Fisheries Commission, and Simon Fraser University. So uh, here's the location of the Patronus Terminal. Uh, next slide, Stephen, if you could. Um, the pro proposed terminal will be situated on Lilu Island with a large trestle, trestle bridge structure that runs parallel to the Flora Bank with a uh, tanker berth at the end of it. So in, on the next slide, there is an aerial image showing the bank, the Flora Bank in question exposed at low tide. And just for some scale, the bank is around 2.5 to 3 kilometers long, so it's quite large. Um, on this image, you can see the Skeena River emptying into the ocean on the right-hand side of the eelgrass bank, um, which you can see with the arrow I've put there. And as part of the salmon life cycle, Skeena juvenile salmon, which number about 100 to 200 million of them, million of them each year swim downstream on their migration from the river out to the ocean and they enter the estuary. Now most of them enter the estuary here, right at the location of the proposed LNG terminal. So on the next slide you'll see what Flora Bank looks like at a mid to high tide when the tides come up, um, when the fish and other aquatic organisms can come and use this habitat. You see the green eelgrass of the Flora Bank um, it's marine vegetation and it's critically important for juvenile salmon as they enter um, the estuary here as it provides shelter from predators for these salmon during one of their most vulnerable life history stages. So um, over the last four years our research program has learned a lot about salmon and over that time, uh, next slide Stephen, um, We've hauled in over 600 purse-staying nets um, across the Skeena estuary, and we've sampled over 100,000 juvenile salmon. So I'd like to share some of the key findings today from this program. Next slide. 
So after sampling and netting salmon in places all over the estuary, we found that we caught salmon in the thousands time and time again in this Florida Bank region where the project is proposed. It's really hard to explain how spectacular this really is when you're out on a boat all day catching 10, 20, maybe 100 fish at a lot of these locations and then you return to Flora Bank at high tide to catch thousands. It's really remarkable to see. And um, when we compared these salmon numbers to those caught at other regions in the Sina estuary, we found that the Flora Bank area proposed for development contained 25 times more salmon than anywhere else. And um, we also found that these salmon were remaining in this area for weeks to months. So they aren't just swimming by on a highway on their way to the ocean. They're feeding and growing and using this habitat. So this is a really critical piece of information because it shows that salmon are using this habitat and that any damage or destruction to this place could affect their survival. So we also ran genetic testing on the juvenile salmon that we collected um, to determine what rivers they come from and who these salmon are. And what we found was that the Flora Bank estuary habitat in question supports over 50 populations of salmon across the Spina watershed. Um, next slide. And this means that the small Flora Bank estuary habitat is supporting a vast watershed, which is about the size of Switzerland, which is incredible. Um, and accordingly, these fish support fisheries from this watershed um, all across this watershed and they have been traced back to over 11 First Nation territories. So this shows that the impacts from this Pacific Northwest LNG terminal will spread from the estuary basically as far as the salmon can swim. So next slide, um, similar fine, oh maybe go back a slide, awesome thank you. So um, we aren't the first people to discover how important Flora Bank is to salmon. Um, uh, for example, in 1972, provincial fishery scientists found that this region is a habitat of critical importance for rearing juvenile salmon. Similar conclusions were found by researchers in 73, 75, and 81, all agreeing that Flora Bank was the worst option for development because of the greatest potential impact to fish. So now I've shared with you some of the scientific evidence available on why this region is so important for salmon. I would like to discuss some of the potential pathways of risk for this Pacific Northwest terminal. So there are many, and I only have time to discuss a few. Um, so for example, one of the bigger ones is that this project would emit approximately 4,400 tons of nitrogen oxide and 200 tons of sulfur oxide every year into this atmosphere. So these are compounds that form acid rain. And we know from studies in the area that many lakes and rivers are vulnerable to acid rain and have very low capacity to neutralize acid. So this could lead to impacts for these freshwater ecosystems. Um, then there is the habitat alteration by dredging and blasting in order to create the marine offloading facility on the north uh, end of Lilu Island, they're estimating that they will have to remove 690,000 uh, 690, cubic meters of rock and sediment. So aside from the sheer destruction of this habitat, some of the sediment has high levels of buried dioxins and furons, which are compounds that came from an old pulp mill not currently operating in the area. And this is a serious concern because dredging and blasting these sediments would resuspend them into the food chain. And these compounds have been shown to cause feminization, which basically means that organisms that come into contact with them are no longer able to reproduce, which is pretty serious. Um, other poten potential impacts to marine life include induced stress and mortality from increased tanker traffic, light and noise from the facility itself and the ship's propellers, and many others. And um, these impacts could potentially affect salmon, but also a whole slew of other users of this estuary, like herring and smelt, uh, porpoises, other marine mammals and birds. And lastly, there is the risk of the 2.7 kilometer long trestle that is predicted to result in the complete loss of Flora Bank. So uh, next slide, Stephen. 
Uh, this prediction was made by scientist Dr. Patrick McLaren, who also worked with the Loch Columns First Nation to research sediment in the area. And he found that Flora Bank, the sand is a relic left behind from the last glacial glaciation, and that is currently being held in place by a balance of forces, currents, tides, and rivers holding this thing in place. And the trestle, with its 264 pilings, each over a diameter, diameter wide, are expected to alter the current regime at one side and cause catastrophic erosion of the flora bank, which would mean that this fish habitat would be lost forever. Next slide. Giving you the one minute warning there, Kira. Okay, awesome. So, despite research demonstrating the importance of flora bank region and many potential pathways of risk that exist, the government this year on their, in their draft assessment um, decided that this project was not likely to cause significant adverse effects. So, based on the decades of available science, some of which I presented briefly today, show that this statement is completely false. Um, and this decision, so how can decision makers come to this conclusion? Next slide. Um, this decision is almost solely based on information from Petronas funded studies. Thus the science that is currently um, at, like undermining this decision making is linked financially to the industry proponent. And the science that is currently being reviewed ignores the large body of independent peer reviewed research which leads to a, this large oversight by decision makers. Um, last slide. So when we really step back and review all the available science, not just the proponent funded science, we can see that the science strongly says that this is a poor location for an industrial project and that the Pacific North Up LNG poses severe risk to salmon from throughout the watershed and ultimately the people and economies that rely on them. Thank you. Thank you, Kira. That was Kira Sharp with Simon Fraser University, who is finishing her degree in Masters of Science under Dr. Jonathan Moore, who has been leading a lot of the studies out there in the estuary. Uh, just a reminder to folks that there is a question tab on your control panel. So if you look down, there's a little arrow that says questions, and if you click on that arrow, you'll it'll it'll open up the panel for you to type questions in. Um, we're going to move on to Max Neweiser from the Pemina Institute. Max is a climate policy analyst for the Pemina Institute. The Pemina Institute was also a member of BC's climate leadership team. So, Max. Thank you, Shannon. Yes, uh, so my name is Max Neweiser. I'm at the Pemina Institute, and among other things, I work on our shale gas and LNG research priority together with my colleague, Matt Horn. And yeah, today I want to talk about the climate implications of the Pacific Northwest LNG project. Um, so I want to get right started and just talk about the scale of the project. So Pacific Northwest LNG is planning on exporting 19.2 million tons of LNG per year from the port of Prince Rupert with gas sourced almost entirely from northeastern BC and more precisely the shale gas and tight gas Montanay region. Um, according to the proponent, the terminal alone would emit around 4.9 million tons of emissions, and, uh, but those aren't just the only emissions associated with the project in BC. To get a full picture of the emissions in BC, you have to look also at associated upstream development, uh, which includes um, you know, all the drilling and processing and transportation of the gas. And when you include these, our initial analysis shows that around 60% of the GHG emissions come from the upstream and 40% from the downstream, from the terminal itself. And, um, and together, uh, this project would actually be one of the largest single industrial sources of, of carbon pollution in all of Canada. Um, since that original analysis, um, BC's government actually came up with a new climate plan and announced some new um, policies that um, regulate emissions from upstream, um, upstream development, including methane management and, and um, electrification. And we included this in our new analysis and updated analysis and still found that including this, these new policies, um, the project would still emit around 9 million tons of, of CO2 per year and would still be one of the largest single industrial sources of emissions in the country. So I wanted 
now put this into context of BC's climate targets. BC has uh, two official climate targets, one for 2020 and one for 2050. And the 2020 target is not very relevant because the project will likely not be operating and um, the province is likely going to miss it anyways. But the 2050 project is actually very relevant because projects, industrial um, infrastructure projects of, of this size operated for a long time and this project will likely operate well past the middle of the century. And BC's legislated 2050 target is an 80% reduction below 2007 levels, which allows for 13 million tons of emissions. Our analysis, our analysis shows that PNW LNG would emit around um, 9 million tons by 2030, which would increase to around 10 million tons by 2050 as the wells get less efficient over time. Now this accounts for roughly 75 to 80 percent of emissions from this single project of the total allowable in BC for that time, which means that the rest of the province would only be able to emit around 3 million tons, which is essentially impossible. So from that we have to conclude that if built, PNW LNG will make it essentially impossible for BC to achieve its climate targets and that there is an inherent disconnect between um, trying to build this project and um, and being sincere about achieving our climate targets. Next slide, please. Now I want to quickly talk about um, what's being done to, uh, to minimize the, emission, the emissions from the project. Um, as some of you may be aware, um, the BC government actually has an LNG benchmark, which we call the cleanest LNG in the world. And this benchmark is a level of 0 0.16 tons of CO2 per ton of LNG produced. And that's actually quite an ambitious benchmark. It's sort of in line with some of the most uh, efficient um, operations out there in the world and certainly more efficient than some of the legacy infrastructure and LNG terminals in Qatar, for example. However, a loophole in the regulation doesn't actually require um, proponents to meet this benchmark. Instead of uh, complying with the benchmark, they can comply by um, buying offsets, for example, for the emissions that exceed the benchmark or paying into technology fund. Now, according to the proponent, they want to export 19.2 million tons for the emissions of 4.9 million tons at the terminal, which gives a carbon intensity of around 0 0.26 tons of CO2 per ton of LNG produced, which is significantly above the LNG benchmark. And it's not that you cannot achieve this LNG benchmark with uh, currently available technology as the two other most advanced pro LNG project proposals show in BC, which is LNG Canada and the wood fiber project. The closest, uh, cl closest example probably is LNG Canada, which is a project of similar size, uh, backed by Shell with a similar time scale, located just 100 kilometers or so away in Kitimat. And LNG Canada plans to achieve an emission intensity of just 0 0.15 tons of CO2, um, according to our analysis, or around 41% better than what PNW LNG is proposing. And they're achieving this by, instead of relying entirely on natural gas, or almost entirely on natural gas, such as, such as PNW LNG, um, LNG Canada is still relying on natural gas to drive their turbines, but is planning to use the waste heat more effectively and is using um, Elect renewable electricity to power a lot of the um, auxiliary, auxiliary operations associated with the plant. Now Shell has determined that these, uh, these technologies are readily available and commercially viable at the current stage. Another example is the wood fiber LNG project, which is a smaller project uh, proposed for the house sound close to Squamish. And now this project is planning to use entirely, rely entirely on electric drives and achieve an emission intensity of around 0 0.05 tons of CO2 per ton of LNG, or around 80% better than what PNW LNG is proposing. Now it's probably realistic to say that this would be just all electric drive, it would be tough for a project like PNW LNG to achieve in, um, in the location and the, in the time frame that they're proposing. But one can easily imagine an alternate scenario where PNW LNG would use readily available commercial technologies uh, to lower the emissions, including, uh, for example, in a scenario where phase one of the project would achieve an emission intensity similar or equal to that of LNG Canada of 0 0.15 tons, and then later on for phase two of the project achieve the intensity, emission intensity of wood fiber LNG. Uh, giving some time to develop the necessary electric infrastructure around it. 
Now this would limit um, emissions from the project to around 2.3 million tons according to our analysis, which is more than 50% better than what the proponent is currently proposing. Uh, and um, again, that's with readily available commercial, commercially viable technology that's available today. And also there's, I'd like to emphasize that there's really no reason not to do that or um, not to be able to do that because PNW LNG is located close to existing electric infrastructure and according to BC Hydro's resource, latest resource options map, um, there's actually really good renewable en energy potential close to Prince Rupert. Next slide, please. Unfortunately, it looks like the province has given up on pushing for sort of best in class or even just better in class performance and that can be seen by looking at the project development agreement that PNWLNG and the province signed last year. Um, this project development agreement or PDA uh, actually prohibits the strengthening of the Greenhouse Gas Industrial Reporting and Control Act which is the main act controlling LNG terminal emissions um, for over 25 years and if the province decides to actually uh, increase some of the stringencies in this act, it would actually have to compensate the proponent for the extra cost incurred. This essentially locks in subpar environmental performance for the next 25 years. Now I'd just like to emphasize that uh, the federal government is actually not bound by this act and um, if when they decide on this project which is on their plate and they require better performance then that is to fill a vacuum for a lack of leadership from the provincial government. And uh, lastly, I'd like to just finish off by quickly mentioning um, the international context piece because it's often argued that um, LNG from BC can actually reduce um, global emissions by um, offsetting coal plants in Asia, for example. Uh, I'd just like to say that um, we would argue that each jurisdiction is responsible for meeting its own emission targets, including BC. And I'd like to re-emphasize that the literature and the science out there shows that introducing more fossil fuels into the global energy mix, including natural gas, is not consistent with limiting climate change to 2 degrees Celsius and as such cannot be seen as a climate solution. And with that, I'd like to say thank you and um, we'll pass it on to the next presenter. Thank you, Max. Again, Max is with the Pembina Institute and is a climate policy analyst. And the Pembina Institute is a member of the BC Climate Leadership Team, appointed by uh, Premier Christy Clark. And next, we have Caleb Bain, who is from Northeast BC, uh, the West Moberly First Nation. He is the executive director of the Keeper of the Waters Society. He also has a law degree from the University of Victoria. He is featured in the film Fractured Land, which addresses a lot of the issues that we're talking about today. He's also on his way overseas tomorrow to speak about these issues as well, and we're grateful to have him here. Caleb. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Caleb Bain. I'm at Show Denny and Denny's. Uh, oh, my goodness, look at that picture. Uh, and I have really awesome tattoos, and I also uh, acknowledge my presence on unceded Coast Salish territory right now. Um, to begin, uh, first of all, <sighs> I have a slight issue with um, the ways in which we engage uh, major resource development. Most of the people on this webinar are going to be familiar and uh, amenable to engaging against these developments. Some of the people on this webinar are going to be industry insiders or people either hired by the RCMP or CSIS or the corporations to monitor activities related. And then, you know, there's a small amount of people who are just interested and eager to learn. So I wanted to flag that issue because looking at what's happening in Standing Rock right now and some of the uh, developments on this project in particular this week and some of the stuff that myself and others are doing up in northeastern BC, which is, you know, the, the source for all of this LNG, indicates that as a movement and as a society, we really need to get beyond uh, our methods of engagement, you know, and um, Max, you mentioned, you know, the Fed government is going to have, uh, isn't bound by the PDA issue. Um, but what we've seen in northeastern BC is cowardice on the part of the federal government, despite their promises to renew the relationship with indigenous people. Uh, and that's proven out by their approval of the Site C project. And that's that's kind of a segue into my first point about the issues with um, 
Pacific Northwest, you know, number one is I come from the feedstock, right? I come from the sacrifice zone. And for those of you who haven't been up there, uh, you wouldn't know this, but uh, that territory is massively impacted by development. Um, we have all kinds of industries. You know, the Suzuki Foundation has done good work on this. Um, you know, the Blueberry River First Nation is bringing a case, the first case of its kind, arguing cumulative impacts uh, are uh, non-compliant with the treaty obligations of the Crown. And for me, you know, I'm no longer the Lands Director for West Mobile First Nation. I resigned a couple months ago. Uh, but my work before law school and after was all frontline consultation work. And in our territory, you know, we've had 60 years of development and all kinds, uh, hydroelectric, coal, wind, etc. And so this project is intrinsically reliant upon massive destruction upstream. And that's a territory that by any analysis uh, has been massively impacted and likely uh, the Crown has uh, disrespected its obligations towards Indigenous people. And my, my personal view, and I think this is increasingly being supported by research and literature on the issue, is that there's fairly significant health impacts and risks associated with fracking and other issues like that, development, oil and gas development, industrial development that are putting you know the lives and health of the people in that region and also the non-human beings up there you know the four-legged ones the winged ones the finned ones and so pacific northwest you know is one of a number of lng plants it's not like my territory has to worry about just one type of development or one particular project but we we are going to have to suffer you know the number um and max i wouldn't mind hearing from him this is one of my questions for the group but how many wells do you have to drill to feed Pacific Northwest, you know, and I know there's variability, but that's that's a number that I don't have, and that my people don't have, you know, um, <clears throat> and that for me is kind of the heart of the issue. This country, and for those of us in the movement, and for those of us concerned about these issues, or even for those of you know from the business community who wants certainty for their investment, this country has been running roughshod over both indigenous rights, but the natural environment for decades, and this project has to get fed. Right, this pipeline has to get filled. It doesn't make sense if it isn't. And so, I have a big issue with LNG in particular because it all has to come from our territory, and we've we haven't even dealt with the consequences of the first 50 years of oil and gas development. Um, you know, the second impact uh, impact or issue is the human health problem. Now, you know, uh, a coalition of doctors, are and 30 plus doctors and healthcare professionals, issued a letter two days ago. Uh, arguing against approval of this project. Now we'll see what the federal government does with that letter. You know, my organization, the organization I'm privileged to be a part of, Keepers of the Water, we signed on. Uh, and in, there is <laughs> there is a lack of direct research on the health impacts associated with oil and gas development. The BC government. Uh, is in the second and I think third phase now of a human health risk assessment with oil and gas in northeastern British Columbia, but that assessment is being carried out without any primary data collection. They're not actually researching. Um, you know, they're not taking samples from people. They're just looking at desktop research and relying upon the complexity of science and the inability of most people to really dig into what a report and their conclusions are and look at the methodologies of research to support their conclusions. So. You know, one issue that myself and a team from uh, Montreal just started working on this week was um, indigenous women's reproductive health in fracking zones. And so one of the problems with Pacific Northwest LNG and also with most types of resource development, but particularly fracking, is the high probability that there is reproductive harm and other types of harms associated that just have a long latency period. So indigenous people who live close to these wells, who eat food and you know traditional diet from areas around these wells and these pipelines and these roads, these sumps, these pits, these flare stacks, they're the ones who you know we're gonna look at in twenty years and be like, oh wow, well that's weird. You have a lot of cancer or like in my case, you know, you have a major cleft lip and palate and a birth defect that cost me eighteen surgeries in eighteen years. And to me, that's profoundly unjust, and that relates, you can kind of extrapolate from that likely injustice that's being 
perpetrated on my territory and my people as the feedstock source for this project. That has a parallel, and that's the erosion of treaty and Aboriginal rights. So not only did the Crown promise my people a great deal, a great number of things in return for peace and friendship, they also, you know, uh, failed to protect us physically. And that kind of double whammy, when you combine it with the cumulative impact issue, really illustrates sort of one of the great injustices of our time, in my opinion, which is like how easily you can run roughshod over populations who don't have the sophistication and access to power, access to the regulatory process, access to courts, access to scientists. Um, you know, on the treaty issue as well, I mentioned the cumulative impacts uh, problem. Uh, there's a lot of contested law right now, and all I, you know, I'm keen to take questions from uh, the attendees, but I think what I want to say primarily is that colonial law, you know, Western, like Canadian law, uh, is a foreign legal system up there, and there's actually a traditional indigenous legal system that's utterly disrespected by all resource development and the current structures by which we as a society say, yes, we're going to build this pipeline, we're going to build this dam, we're going to you know, build this flare stack in this spot. <clears throat> and I think that's something that should be of concern to all of us because not only do these kind of projects, and this project in particular, represent something that has a great deal of risk to the natural ecosystems to human populations, but it it's actually eviscerating kind of some of the last great frontier spaces in our country and also the last uh, unique legal systems and spiritual systems and, and cultural systems that have already had to survive a couple hundred years of genocide. And you know Pacific Northwest LNG in particular, but it's not unique in this regard, doesn't have free prior informed consent of indigenous peoples. There's a strong argument in law that approval of this project constitutes a violation of international law. Now, guess how much money it costs to take that question to the appropriate court, right? The nations up in the Northeast, I mean, in the Northeast, we have to not spend money on elder care. We have to not send our kids to university. We have to not buy the means to purify our contaminated water on reserve because we're busy trying to make the Western BS legal system progress to the point where it recognizes how deeply it's disrespected indigenous people and the land and the very principles they claim to uphold in the form of the fiduciary doctrine and the honor of the crown. And again, you look at Standing Rock, you look at, you know, all these health scientists and healthcare providers and doctors saying this is likely a major issue. This particular project has climate implications, it has human health implications. As I said, me and my team were looking and trying to figure out where the rough data gaps are on our understanding of the impacts of fracking and indigenous women's reproductive health and children's health and neonatal health because it's pretty obvious from uh, lit reviews and looking at other types of toxins and other types of toxic chemicals and development zones, that there's probably a latent issue. It just takes too long for the cancers to develop that we can understand it quick enough to make the regulatory regime respond. Um, another issue for those, you know, right-wing business-oriented ECDEV folks, uh, there's two kind of major problems. One is the division of families and communities. So for those of you from the territory and you're and all on the pipeline, but you're seeing the pro-business, pro-economic development cohort seeking agreements, seeking impact benefit agreements, seeking jobs, seeking contracts, and then you know people who have a more land-based perspective, or traditional perspective, or you know a precautionary principle that says maybe we shouldn't frack our water because we don't really know whether deep wells actually communicate with shallow water, and you can't clean up an aquifer. Um, you know, people like that are getting divided. And so you have these fairly sensitive, unique communities that are being like literally torn asunder, ripped apart from the inside. And I think that's unfair because this development and developments like it lock us into a hydrocarbon economy. You know, people in my territory don't have the ability to choose to work in the solar industry. We don't have the ability to transition to geothermal. We don't have the options to choose not to desecrate our territory. You know, I'm lucky. I'm privileged. I got my law degree. You know, I had a lot of support. So I'm a rare exception to the rule up there that if you want to feed your family and do right by your kids, you're going to have to desecrate your land. 
and that's I mean that's profoundly unjust, but it's also deeply unsustainable, right? Keep Taylor, you have about thirty seconds left. <laughs> okay, um, and then I guess you know, to sum up, as is obvious, I mean I have a pretty strong opinion on this. Anyone who knows me or knows my work understands that. Uh, what I'd like to put out to the group is just a challenge. You know, I would like um, some of the hard questions, and I would actually like to see some uh, commitments from those of us, you know, who are listening to my voice and others to do some things, you know, because there is actual tangible things we can do on Pacific Northwest LNG, both legally and in terms of uh, other aspects of engagement to slow down and stop these projects. And from an indigenous perspective in Northeast BC, you know, when you delay this kind of stupidity, this kind of like dangerous development, you're leaving space open for something better to manifest. And that's what I think we need in the Northeast. That's what I think we need globally. And that's what I think a lot of indigenous people in my territory and others are fighting for because water's life. Thank you. Thank you, Caleb, for that incredibly passionate presentation. Uh, you can follow or learn more about Caleb Bain uh, on his film FracturedLand.com or he, he's actually uh, featured in the film by director Damien Gillis. Uh, we're going to move to David Hughes. David Hughes is an earth scientist, uh, uh, the former uh, geoscientist who, did, who worked with the Geological Survey of Canada for several decades. And David is going to talk about fracking, uh, energy security and some economics behind the fracking and LNG industry in Canada. Thanks, Shannon. I can't see my presentation, unfortunately, but David, if you have your presentation up with you there, um, what you could do is tell Stephen next slide and sort of follow with it. David had a bit of an altercation last night when lightning took out his internet. So he's calling in and presenting by phone and can't actually see what's being presented, one of the realities of more rural living. Doesn't look too good here, Shannon. <laughs> I'm sorry. My uh, computer went to sleep. And uh, just hold on a sec. I'm gonna. Sorry about this, people. I'll just. Uh... Okay, so while David's dealing with his glitches, um, we just wanted to let you know that this presentation is being recorded, and we will have it online available for you in a couple of days. Um, and if, again, if you have any questions for the presenters, there is the question box on your control panel, and please send us questions, and we'll have the different presenters uh, answer them to the best of their ability. And we'll just give David a couple more minutes to try to get his computer to wake up. Yeah, I think it's going to work here. Just hang on a second. No worries. And thanks to those who are live tweeting from this uh, from the forum. Twitter has been lighting up. The notifications are pouring in. Um, and if you want to give us a follow, we are at Skeena Watershed on Twitter, or you have the Pembina Institute on Twitter as well. Oh, okay, I've got it. So if you can put up the first slide, which is the title slide. My slides are numbered. Uh, go to slide two. So I'd like to look uh, at the whole issue of gas supply for the LNG projects kind of in the bigger picture and implications on long-term energy security. Review some of the environmental impacts which we've already looked at to a certain extent. And finally, uh, look at the economic viability of the whole LNG uh, gambit. Next slide. This is from the BC LNG website. Uh, basically, there's 20 proposed LNG projects. Uh, 18 of them have been granted NEB export licenses. We heard in the 2013 throne speech that LNG would create a 100 billion prosperity fund and 100,000 jobs, which hasn't happened, obviously. Next slide, slide four. If you look at those 20 terminals, uh, the 20 terminals being in red, 
there's something in excess of 300 million tons per annum of LNG capacity for, for exports. The, the entire global LNG industry is only about 250 uh, metric tons per year. So nobody thinks that 20 terminals are going to be built. The high number for the BC government is five terminals at about 82 million tons per annum. And the, the low estimate uh, is, is one terminal of about the size of Pacific Northwest LNG, which is around 19 uh, metric tons per annum. Next slide. Slide five. If we look at natural gas production in Canada over the last uh, couple of decades, we can see that, that it peaked in 2001. As of 2016, it was about 14% below peak, and two-thirds of that gas came from Alberta, which is essentially flat at this point in time. Uh, the only real growth picture for natural gas production in Canada is BC, which is about 30% as of mid-2016 of total Canadian production. Next slide. Slide six. The National Energy Board produced a, a new energy futures report for Canada last January. And this is their projection to 2040 for gas production in Canada by province. And you can see that, that really Alberta is flat, which has historically been most of the uh, gas production. And NEB is projecting a, a renaissance, uh, a strong growth in Canadian gas production, but Virtually all of that growth is coming from BC, so they're expecting BC to nearly double its gas production by 2040, when it will be close to half of Canadian production. Next slide. Slide seven. If we look at the NEB projection by, by use, we can see Canadian demand for gas growing sharply. Uh, NEB had enough gas production in this forecast for one LNG terminal the size of Pacific Northwest. Land exports to the U.S. mainly are projected to decline to almost nothing because the uh, shale gas picture in the U.S. Is, has caused a lot of production growth down there and less need for, ex for imports. Next slide. Slide eight. If you look at those different scenarios that I showed you on uh, the amount of gas needed for these LNG projects, you can see that if we have one LNG project, the Green Line, uh, basically we, we run out of supply by about 2040. If we go to five LNG, projects, which is the red line at the bottom, will be short about 75 trillion cubic feet of gas by 2040, um, according to the, the NEB projection. Next slide, slide nine. So if we really wanted to build the BC government's high case, five terminals in total, we'd be looking at a, a massive ramp up in gas production from Northeast BC. And by 2040, 47% of all of Canada's gas production would be exported as LNG. Next slide. Slide 10. This is uh, an estimate of marketable gas resources in BC by formation and by gas type. Uh, in essence, horizontal drilling combined with hydraulic fracturing uh, or fracking has opened up a lot of gas resources in, in BC. But 84% of those resources are contained within two formations. The Montany, which is really a, a tight gas slash shale gas play in the Horn River. Uh, conventional gas, the gas that we used to get out of Northeast BC, is only 6% of marketable gas resources. Next slide, slide 11. Uh, 
basically shows you the distribution of the gas resources in, in northeast BC, uh, mainly Montney, but also the Horn River, some much lesser explored resources in the Liar Basin and Cordova and Bayman. Next slide, slide 12. If you look at what's happened with BC gas production over the last 30 years, you can see that all plays except for the Montney and Horn River are in decline. So two plays are now producing 64% of BC gas, and they're the only option for growth. Next slide. If we look at technology, how that gas is being produced, uh, the, the combination of horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing, as I mentioned, has opened up a lot of new supply, and, it, and it's really the only game in town. Uh, you know, as of 2015, 82% of BC's gas was came from horizontal wells, so the supply for the Petronas facilities is going to come from from fracking. There's no question about that. Next slide, slide 14. There's been some issues that we've heard about, uh, particularly in Oklahoma and Arkansas, about induced seismicity earthquakes uh, related to hydraulic fracturing and injection of wastewater. This is a, a picture of the drilling in, in the Montney and, and Duvernay of Alberta. Basically, the silver silver dots are horizontal wells, the black dots are vertical wells. The red bullseyes are magnitude four to five earthquakes. Several of those, uh, three of them at least on the BC side of the border, have been related to fracking. The smaller yellow dots are, are magnitude three to four earthquakes. So there's swarms of, of the smaller ones. They haven't caused any noticeable surface damage because basically the remoteness and the sparsity of the population up there, but there's still an issue. Next slide. Slide 15. Uh, basically, this is a determination of the amount of, of land disturbance that you would have to have. In each of the cases, Caleb asked how many wells would you have to drill to have five LNG terminals, and the answer is about 44,000. Uh, to put that in perspective, there's been about 25,000 wells drilled since the 50s uh, in total in northeast BC. So we're going to be massively uh, increasing the footprint. Uh, if you look at the, the right-hand side, the no terminal case, we're still going to need gas. We're still, still going to be drilling a lot of wells. So, you know, oil and gas exploration is not going to go away. It's just a question of scale. Next slide, slide 16. This was alluded to by Max in terms of the greenhouse gas impacts of LNG. One of the big selling points of the BC government is displacing coal plants in China and cleaning up the environment. But in fact, if you look at the methane emissions in the, in the whole supply chain, um, and methane is a much more potent greenhouse gas than CO2 over a short period of time. On a 20-year basis, LNG, if you include the full life cycle emissions, is 27% worse than coal. On a 100-year time frame, it, it's a little bit better. Uh, but the, the question is, you're going to have to wait for 50 years for an improvement. So is, is this really a, a way to reduce uh, global atmospheric greenhouse gas emissions? Next slide. I did a study looking at the, the implications of the Paris Agreement, which was signed in December, uh, basically committing to a 30% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions below 2005 levels by 2030. If you look at the new plan in Alberta to cap the oil sands emissions at 100 megatons per year, and you build one large LNG facility like Pacific Northwest, uh, this is what it looks like. Uh, we, we 
we grow the oil and gas sector from about 26% today to 45% of Canada's emissions in 2030. And that means the rest of the economy has to contract by 47% from 2014 levels, which is it's going to be difficult, if not impossible. Next slide, slide 18. BC's carbon tax has been talked about a lot, and Trudeau has basically announced the possibility of a national carbon tax. But if you look at what that tax actually did, uh, it was announced in 2008 by Premier Campbell. Uh, it brought down emissions by about 0.9% over a period of seven years. So the results of that tax haven't been spectacular, to say the least. One wonders how high a price you'd have to put on carbon to make significant inroads. Next slide. Max also alluded to this. This is the emissions estimates of the Pacific Northwest LNG from the draft uh, Canadian Environmental Assessment Agency report released last February. So the LNG facility itself, about 5.3 megatons per year. Upstream production, uh, 6.5 to 8.7. So if you put that together, uh, that's around 20% of BC's annual emissions as of 2014, which is the most recent year that we have data for. Next slide, slide 20. This uh, basically projects out to 2030, assuming that BC will have to meet the Paris Agreement targets, the 30% below 2005 levels. And you can see what the impact of Pacific Northwest LNG would be. About 20% today and about 28% by the time we get to 2030. So that means that the rest of the BC economy would have to reduce emissions by 48% from 2014 levels. If you built three of those plants, you'd almost completely wipe out the ability for the rest of BC's economy to, uh, to emit any carbon. Next slide. Slide 2021. 20, uh, this is the latest landed LNG prices uh, globally. BC LNG would be targeting the Southeast Asia market, Japan, uh, China. It costs probably in the neighborhood of three to four dollars per million BTUs to produce the gas in Canada, and another six dollars to ship it to Southeast Asia. So you need to ha have a price in Southeast Asia of about ten dollars to break even. Current prices in China are five thirty-eight. So it's a you know complete money losing proposition at this point, which is why we haven't seen any uh, you know any firm commitments to to build these plants in BC, and that's not likely to change, at least in the medium term. Uh, so the economics really don't don't make any sense. We'll see if uh, Pacific Northwest goes ahead. Uh, next slide. So clearly, when you look I at I've giving you the two minute warning. Oh no, that, that that's it. I'm I'm finished. Uh, if you, if you add up all of the uh, the implications that, that Max and Caleb and others have talked about. Uh, that truism is certainly very true. <laughs> There's no such thing as a free lunch. Thank you. Thanks, David Hughes. Uh, so now we're going to move into the question section, uh, the question and answers. And I'm going to hand it over to Karen Tamu of the Pembina Institute to moderate the question and answer period. Thanks to all those who have tuned in. Again, there are still live tweets. Uh, happening right now, so um, if you could take to Twitter, that would be great, and let us know what your thoughts and feedback have been about the information that you've heard so far. And again, we will be posting a live recording of this uh, online in a few days. So, Karen Tam Wu. Thanks, Shannon. And uh, just a reminder to folks that you do have a question box where you can uh, pose some questions.
So um, I have a question from one of the audience members that heard that one of Petronas's Petronas first acts was to ask for Canadian chartered banks to loan them $15 billion. Is this true? And if so, did they provide the loan? Um, wondering if any of the panelists have a response to that. And when it comes to the way that Petronas would or wouldn't achieve uh, investment money, I don't know that that's an area of expertise uh, that any of our panelists would have looked into. But it's a very good question. And, uh, and if you have the ability, I think you should tweet that question as well. Uh, we certainly will. Um, so thanks for that question. Um, another question about the importance of eelgrass and what basically if Kiara could talk a little bit more about the importance of the estuary and the habitat uh, and, and why that ecosystem is important. Um, hi, so basically eelgrass is discussed in the scientific literature as being a place that salmon can use to hide from predators bigger fish, um, other kinds, um, like the whole marine ecosystem sort of feeds on juvenile salmon as they enter the estuary. And so the vegetation sort of provides a little refuge for the juvenile salmon um, at that stage of their life. Um, you can often find juvenile salmon around near shore areas, depending on the species, and they sort of like that vegetative cover. Um, however, in the literature, it's definitely discussed that um, you often find certain kinds, certain salmon species in eelgrass more than um, areas that don't have eelgrass. Um, let, let me know if you want some further clarification um, about anything else, but generally um, that's just what's believed about the eelgrass. Thanks, Kara. A uh, question about if the federal government approves Pacific Northwest LNG, what can we do after that? Is the fight over? Um, and I think that probably all the panelists will have an opinion on that, so it's an opportunity for uh, all the panelists to weigh in on that one. Okay, well, no one's speaking up, so this is Caleb speaking. Um, you know, what we've seen <clears throat> in Northeast BC is federal approval, and then, as I mentioned in my, my comments, it's it's up to the nations to then seek judicial review under you know violations of consultation law basically generally there's some other you know technical ways to to go after a uh, decision but we have the legal option which you know a judicial review costs you know even a statement of claim will cost you fifteen twenty thousand taking it all the way through to first round of hearings maybe a hundred hundred twenty thousand uh, all the way to the Supreme Court a couple million. You know, so West Wembley First Nation, which is one of the last two nations fighting Site C, I mean, you know, I can't disclose how much they've spent, but every dollar they've spent, they could have used on, like, you know, giving my grandmother a dignified place to spend her last years, or improving their water supply, or improving their Head Start program, or uh, creating a new solar geothermal economy. And the first thing you can do as a nation, because we have standing to kind of appeal these kind of issues, is engage in the law. But the problem is the nations are the ones, especially up there, and also in unceded territories. And I think this would apply as well to those nations down at the other end of the pipeline. But we could, you know, go after those decisions. But you gotta, you know, you gotta imagine from a chief's perspective: Do you give a couple hundred thousand dollars to a bunch of consultants and lawyers? because we haven't actually stopped any projects in court, really. I mean, we'll see what happens at Enbridge, but a related issue um, is you realize that, you know, if you get the LNG plant, you get the pipeline, and the pipeline is a corridor, and it's not that hard to change a pipeline uh, using modern technology or twin a pipeline or expand the right way to facilitate condensate oil water hypothetically and so nations when we look at these issues we have to kind of think beyond just the discrete particular approval to include other potentialities and I think that 
that's one of the reasons why nations are kind of paralyzed as all these projects get approved. Um, and then, of course, there's the direct action side of things. So Standing Rock, you know, the no DAPO, water is sacred kind of movement. That's really pushing Clayton Thomas Miller. I'm not sure if he's on here, but maybe uh, he could pop and post a link to his article on what happens if Trudeau approves pipelines. You know, we had uh, Stuart Phillip down in Standing Rock. A lot of my friends are down there. Um, one of my buddies was arrested a couple of days ago. You know, so that direct action side of things is there too. But then you got to think about the security apparatus and the militarization of energy infrastructure in Canada and what that means. You know, I'm not sure if anyone else wants to speak to that issue. Well, when it comes to other things that you can do, um, uh, if if for some reason that the federal government does decide to approve this project. Uh, is is it over? And the and the short answer is absolutely not. There are several different avenues that people can take, both First Nations and community. Uh, one is the possibility of litigation, like Caleb mentioned, through either judicial review and questioning um, how the how the decisions were made. Uh, one of the things that are very clear is that the independent peer-reviewed science resoundingly says that this project is is a terrible idea. So the common sense and science-based decision making. Uh, uh, comes to one conclusion and so if that isn't the conclusion then that will be certainly something that can be reviewed in the courts. Other options, there are lots of people on the front lines um, who are actively dealing with this right now. Kayla mentioned things that are happening down at Standing Rock and there are also things that are happening uh, in, in British Columbia right now where people are engaging in different types of acts of civil disobedience for example um, because they have been frustrated uh, participating in the system um, and haven't seen the results um, that they felt were fair. So you have uh, the people on Lindu Island where the, where the um, Patronas PNW uh, frack gas facility is proposed. Uh, people from the community of Black Olams are now occupying their traditional territory there. There is the House of Lukadziwis, uh, uh, Maddie Lee on Gitsan territory who is actively occupying their traditional territory there which also covers 32.1 kilometers of the Trans-Canada pipeline that would take the fracked gas from Northeast BC to, um, to the Pacific Northwest LNG terminal. So you can support those kinds of actions and at the end of this, um, at the end of this forum we will post uh, a link to our website where you can send messages to uh, members of parliament and ask them to stand with science-based decision-making and climate action. Awesome. Um, so just so folks know, uh, we do have quite a few questions um, coming up and that's great. So we originally had planned to um, wrap this part off at 8, but we'll, the speakers have agreed to go um, a few more minutes longer so we can try and get through as many questions as possible. So I have a uh, couple of questions here related to the federal government's role um, that I'm going to try and tie together and hopefully that makes sense. Um, one question, the first question is that it was pointed out that the federal government isn't bound by the project development agreement. So they could increase the standards to be met, but then does that mean BC would have to pay compensation? Um, because it seems like a surprising gap for Petronas to leave. Um, and then secondly, it was mentioned that the federal government could overrule the 25 year carbon tax shield for PNW LNG, what would it take for government to take action on that? So it's Max here. Um, I, I can take a step at the first question. Um, I might have to ask for a repeat of the second question. But um, from my understanding um, regarding the PDA and if um, the federal government demands stronger performance, uh, it would not require um, the BC government to pay compensation um, for um, for stronger climate policies and that's because the PDA is really specifically linked to BC's Greenhouse Gas Industrial Reporting and Control Act and any carbon measures associated with that and um, yeah so if the, the federal government would require higher standards that would fall outside that act and um, it wouldn't require compensation and I didn't quite understand the first question I would have to ask for clarification I'll just repeat the question. Um, it was mentioned that the federal government can overrule the 25-year carbon tax shield for PNW. What would it take for the government to take action on that? Or if that's not the case, could you clarify? 
Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure what it would take. I think, I mean, if the federal government imposes a stronger carbon tax um, that will fall outside the jurisdiction of the Greenhouse Gas Industrial Putting Control Act, so I don't think um, that would impact the project or any of the compensation associated with the project. Um, so I think they're free to do that as they like and they're not bound by any of the PDA agreements. But I'm not sure about that. So somebody else, feel free to take a stab at it. Okay, uh, in the meantime, um, I have another question. If we have four land-based export facilities proposed for the Prince Rupert area and approximately five floating facilities, all this area is uh, biodiverse, ecologically sensitive, and if PNW is built, it will wipe out our entire ecosystem. Will they be using the life in the water as almost, almost uh, a, a car, as carbon credits to offset the emissions? So I, I a question around how are these projects looking to use carbon offsets? So, so Maxi, I, I can take a very quick step on uh, one of the mechanisms in the um, BC um, regulation is to just um, buy um, emission credits from facilities that outperform the benchmark. So for example, PNWLNG could buy emission permits from uh, wood fiber if it went ahead because they would have extra emission, per extra permission, emission permits to sell under this law. Um, so that would be one. Um, and then the other one I think would just be quali qualified um, emission offsets that go through some sort of vetting. I'm not quite sure uh, what the process is there. I would have to look into it. And then the last option would be to pay into a technology fund for about $25 a ton. Um, but um, one last quick thing to note is that there's actually also an environmental performance credit that actually rebates um, between half and all of the amount that um, proponents would have to pay if they come close to but don't quite meet um, the benchmark. So there's that as well. Uh, David, this question might be directed at you. Uh, what is included in the tolling charge? Uh, sorry, what was that? What is included in the tolling charge? It, in the tolling charge, it, is that what you said? Sorry? Yeah, I said the tolling charge. Uh, basically, uh, A to B transportation, you know, in terms of pipelines. Uh, if you're looking at, at the emissions that come out of that, um, you know, there's quite a bit. Pipeline emissions are uh, basically methane leakage is pretty significant part of the total life cycle. Uh, greenhouse gas impact of LNG. Okay, thanks. Uh, Caleb, a question for you around impact benefit agreements and uh, how you mentioned that IBAs and economic development initiatives often divide communities. In your experience, have you seen benefits from IBAs and economic development initiatives trickled down um, and, and actually being realized by members of the communities? Mm, okay, well, I'm no longer a lawyer, so I can't technically get disbarred, but I can make my future real hard. <clears throat> um, it, there are benefits, but you have to understand that like, it's not like money is not qualified plus, right? Because what happens is, one, your lawyers and consultants are going to take a chunk right off the top, and then you're going to lose a portion to administration, right? So, you know, it's the people in the Indian administration in the community who are, you know, handling the checks and all that. There's no guarantee that they're actually indigenous. There's no guarantee that they're community members. And then you have to filter those benefits through whichever apparatus you have in the community, you know, like aging, crumbling, decrepit infrastructure to actually see some benefit for the community. And then the final issue is, you know, if your vision of indigenous economic development is driving a tractor or a cat through a river, like if, they, if that's what you think 2016 should be, 
you have an emaciated, simplistic, ignorant understanding of the realities of the 21st century, in my opinion. So, yes, I've seen all kinds of benefits. I've seen consultants and lawyers get rich. I've seen, you know, chiefs who I think uh, perhaps travel a bit too much and stay in pretty nice hotels who eat pretty good uh, versus, you know, kids in the community who maybe don't get those opportunities. I've also seen amazing and wonderful initiatives where people are trying to green their community, buy solar panels, invest in Head Start, you know, engage in sort of obesity uh, engagement stuff, changing their food security mix, like all kinds of good stuff comes from it. But the thing is, you got to recognize, like, <laughs> Who's going to suffer to get this impact benefit agreement? It's not like they're giving us like a sizable portion of the billions of dollars they make in royalties, right? It's not like you know they're paying a fair rate of return to the people who got to suffer and live next to this crap. You know, they, what's what's the public health care cost of a mean ten percent increase in major childhood birth defects over fifty years in an LNG zone? How much does that cost the taxpayer? How much human suffering does that cost? And someone's going to tell me that, you know, like a $100 million IBA is going to benefit us. You know, it, the economy and the economics of these developments and the economics of human suffering and indigenous suffering in resource development zones is poorly understood. So, yeah, if I want to take the bait, like, of course, I've seen benefits. But if you look at it in context and you think critically about what it is we're actually engaging with, then you realize that the benefits don't even begin to offset the consequences and the risks. And it's always the indigenous people, the people of color, in particular indigenous women, who have to suffer for this stupidity. Thanks, Caleb. Um, so just one, well, two last questions that kind of lead into uh, us wrapping this up. Um, one is where can folks find photos of where the proposed terminals would be and or uh, where the um, gas fields are located? Uh, I think the photo that Stephen just pulled up is uh, representative of that. So if there is a resource out there that public can access so they can get a, I guess, a good visual of where this all exists. That'd be great to know. And then lastly, you know, there's been a few hints that we need to take action. So what is it that we should do? And then uh, I'll throw it back to Shannon with those two questions. Yeah, you know, on the first one, there's that, that slide that I had in my deck that I presented here. But we also published a CCPA report, a clear view of BCLNG, which is a, a free download from the CCPA website that has a lot more detail on the number of wells needed for different scenarios, uh, where the fields are, what the decline rates are, and so forth. Great. Thanks, David. And then Shannon, what should people do tonight and after tonight? Thanks, Karen. Well, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, this was it. Did we did go 15 minutes over time? So thanks to those who have stayed on, and a big special thanks to our presenters. These are people who are incredibly busy, who are doing active science, organizing, policy um, analysis uh, every day, and and. And thanks to everybody who has tuned in and tweeted live from, from this forum. Uh, you can go to skeenawatershed.com and we have two sort of actions on there. Right on the main page, there's a big take action link uh, that will allow you to send a message that you can edit uh, and put in your own concerns from maybe from things that you've heard tonight. And those will go to cabinet ministers and Justin Trudeau himself because they are the ones who are going to be making this decision prior to October 2nd is the latest news that we're hearing. Um, and also on the right hand side you'll see a link to support people who are on the front line. So there are a number of groups and, and organizations who are um, who are taking direct action uh, against this industry and for those of you who join tonight I hope you join with us in being concerned about what this industry means for the whole as BC. Uh, for those who don't know, we started this organization, the Skeena Watershed Conservation Coalition, uh, out, of, out of concern that, that people's, uh, people didn't have the opportunity to get 
various perspective when it comes to development. So hearing from both sides, uh, multiple values and perspectives, uh, different sort of sides of the equation, and then we ask people to make a decision. Um, so people have heard extensively from Patronus, from TransCanada, from the BC government, and we haven't been able to compete with the millions of dollars uh, that are driving these PR campaigns. And all we can do is bring forth science and facts and add up mathematical equations. And in this case, it doesn't seem that the math adds up. So thanks everybody for joining tonight. Please take action and we'd love to hear feedback about what you've thought about this, this forum. Thanks again and have a good night.